Okay, let's continue looking at the disciples in regards to Jesus and calling Jesus Jehovah. Thomas pronounced, My Lord and my God, to Jesus in John twenty twenty eight. It's more than an exclamation properly understood in the context of the fourth gospel. It is the climax of the disciples' progressive understanding of who Jesus really is. In Colossians, Paul forthrightly declares Christ to be the one in whom the wholeness of deity dwells bodily. The wholeness of deity dwells bodily in Christ. That's in Colossians 2.9. Now in Titus, Jesus is called our great God and Savior. Titus 2.13. And the writer of Hebrews addresses Christ as Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. In Hebrews 1.8. Paul elsewhere speaks of Christ as the, as the form of God, a phrase that obviously means as the essence of God, parallel to the phrase form of man, which means the existence of man, Philippians 2.5. A similar phrase, the image of God, is used to portray Christ's deity in the New Testament, Colossians 1.15. Meaning in this context, not only the representation, as it means elsewhere, Genesis 1.26, but the manifest manifestation of God himself. Hebrews strengthens this description of Christ's deity, saying that he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. The prologue of John is unequivocal on the subject of Christ's deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 1, 1. The absence of the definite article, the, does not indicate that this verse should be translated, the Word of God was a God. The grammatical construction without the definite article means the Word was of the essence of God, which is a strong way to describe his deity. The New Testament contains many other intimations of Christ's deity, the strongest of which are those that relate to his being creator of all things. Now let's look at E for equal with the disciples, equal to God, or Jesus was given powers possessed only by God. So the disciples of Christ not only gave him titles of Jehovah or deity, but they also attributed to him powers that only God possesses. The New Testament writers declare that Jesus raised the dead, John 5:11, and yet the Old Testament declares Jehovah killeth and maketh alive, 1 Samuel 2:6, Deuteronomy 32:39. Isaiah pronounced Jehovah as the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, 4.9. And Jeremiah called him the former of all things, 10.16. The New Testament writers speak of all these things being created through Christ, John 1, 2, Colossians 1, 16. Likewise, for the Jews, who can forgive sins but God alone, Mark 2, 7. And yet, without hesitation, the New Testament writers attribute the same power to Jesus in Acts 5.31. Such an attribution should remove all reasonable doubt as to whether they believed in the deity of Christ. So, the Old Testament, Jehovah kills and makes alive. New Testament, Jesus raised the dead. Old Testament, Jehovah, everlasting creator of the ends of the earth. New Testament, all things created through Christ. Who can forgive sins but God alone? New Testament, Jesus forgives sins. Now let's look at M for Messiah in regards to the disciples. Jesus was considered to be the Messiah God. Many Old Testament man, man, messianic passages make it clear that it is Jehovah who is to be the Messiah. Jehovah is called King. And it is the angel of Jehovah who will redeem them. Jehovah is the stone, and yet Messiah is to be the rejected stone. The Messiah is spoken of in the Old Testament as Lord, when it is written, Jehovah saith to my Lord, a passage which the New Testament writers apply to Christ. 
Isaiah provided the messianic challenge to the Jews, saying, Behold your God. Indeed, there is no clear messianic passage of the deity of Christ in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. With these predictions, the New Testament writers concur, declaring Jesus to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew one twenty three from Isaiah seven fourteen. In brief, the Old Testament mes In brief, the Old Testament Messiah was Jehovah, and the New Testament writers identified Jesus with the Old Testament Messiah. One often overlooked passage in Zechariah says literally in the Hebrew text, "When they look on me." whom they have pierced, in reference to Jehovah. The New Testament writers do not hesitate to apply this twice to Jesus, thereby affirming the identity of Jehovah pierced as the Jesus crucified. John 19.37, Revelation 1.7 In his role as Messiah one day, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2.11. But the passage from which Paul takes this citation declares, For I am God and there is no other. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue swear. Isaiah 45.22 So the implications of this are strong. Jehovah alone is God and to him every knee shall bow. But Paul declares that it is Jesus, Jehovah, before whom one day all will bow. They will all confess that Jesus is Lord, Jehovah, to the glory of God. Now let's take a, a look at worship. Jesus was worshipped not only by men and their disciples, but by angels. Jesus received worship from men on at least nine occasions, as we discussed before. This he did without ever rebuking the worshippers. And sometimes he seems to have encouraged it, as we, we spoke about before. But what removes any lingering doubt that the disciples of Christ believe that he should be worshipped as God in the fact of angelic worship? Jesus is portrayed as being far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians one twenty one, even the demons submitted to his commands. Matthew eight thirty two. What is more, angels who themselves refuse to be worshipped in the Bible, see Revelation twenty two eight. So the angels are presenting presented as worshiping Christ in an unmistakably lucid affirmation. The Bible, the book of Hebrews says, "For to what angel did God ever say?" Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And yet, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. What could be more emphatic? Christ is not an angel, but the unique Son of God. And all the angels must worship him. Whether this view of Christ is correct or not, there should be no doubt that it is what the disciples of Christ taught. Indeed, as was already shown, it is what Jesus thought of himself. He claimed to be all that God is, and his disciples believed it, as C.S. Lewis promptly observed in the context of Christ's claims, we are faced with marked alternatives. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish things that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claims to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who has merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. <laughs> 